very good morning to all of you and even as uh, I begin to share the word can I just ask you to bow your heads in prayer Lord Jesus I want to thank you Lord for this opportunity that you give us as your children to come and receive your word we thank you for these weekly gatherings that we have this time that we you have set apart for us lord so that we can come as your children as your congregation as your worshipers to worship you lord to give you our praise and honor lord to learn from your word what you have what you are speaking to us that it would strengthen us and do in us that which makes us more and more like your son jesus so father we want to thank you that we are so privileged to be your children we are so privileged to call be called your own and we live in this blessing and we live in this wonderful family that you put together lord under your name and we pray that today as you speak lord you would use me you would anoint me and lord you would the holy spirit would hover in this in the midst of the people lord and today would indeed help us to understand you that a revelation would come to each one of us and that lord we would we would just glorify you in response and we would live out your word in jesus precious name we pray amen amen, amen. amen. all right so we have been studying or we have been going through our foundation series and uh, uh last week aaron covered on the habit of daily meditation the importance of god's word and uh, i want to go back a little bit uh for the topic that we skipped because we wanted to do it in a series and uh, then what that is on the aspect of person of the holy spirit we have already studied from an from an angle of who he is as a person we have looked at the work of the holy spirit and uh, today we will be doing we will be learning uh, or studying the doctrine of the baptism of the holy spirit and uh, i do this with great fear because i am speaking of the person of god who has yet to be understood in his entirety and i don't think we can ever understand it completely but we live in the age of the holy spirit we live in the time when the holy spirit is in our midst he is working in us he lives in us and he is working through us we are going to talk about the person of god who who god has sent to come and lead us and guide us and counsel us we lean on the holy spirit our lives a very aspect of being christian is foundational to the person of the holy spirit in that when we become believers and the way we live it cannot be done without him and i hope that as i share i would be able to be very specific and keep to the word of god and that we all would learn something today we all would un- understand what we need to take back we are called a charismatic church we are called a church that is really operating in the in the power of the holy spirit but a question that i want to uh, want us to ask ourselves today is are we really doing that are we really seeing the person of the holy spirit very evident in our lives and that answer will define where we stand now the, obviously the baptism of the holy spirit is different from the water baptism you have to change the slide not change So when you have, when you would have been taken through the chapter of water baptism I just want to do a quick recap Now this baptism is the baptism of a demonstration of repentance and faith it is a first step of obedience and it symbolizes washing away of former sins or to put it in another way forgiveness of sins and uh, identification with the death burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ Now one major distinction I would say that we as christians should understand about the difference between baptism in water and baptism of the holy spirit is that the baptism in water is really our side of the covenant 
When a person makes a covenant with somebody else, it has to be two-sided. There are two parties involved. There are two people involved. And in the covenant, the covenant God establishes with us, when we believe and we accept Him, and we receive forgiveness, when we take water baptism, it is our side of the agreement saying, Lord, I testify publicly that I I am going to be loyal to you, I am going to be committed to you, that you are going to be Lord and Savior of my life and no one else. And that is our side of the agreement, that's what I mentioned, it's, it's our signature, it's, it's we sign on the cover and paper and say, fine, Lord, this is my side, I commit. I will keep up to my side. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that, the, is a covenant that, which requires God's signature. And says, I agree to and then it is sealed. Alright. So an agreement cannot have only one signature. When two parties are involved. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is so critical for every Christian. That if I claim to have signed it. So as to say. And there is no signature of the Holy Spirit. I am not a Christian. God has not allowed me in the kingdom. It has just gone halfway. And I hope that as we read the scriptures, this will get even more clear. Now the baptism of the Holy Spirit is also very closely linked to regeneration. Can someone tell me what the other word of regeneration is? Other than Tanga. Because I discussed with him yesterday. What is the other word for regeneration? Reborn. Reborn. Yeah, born again, right? Born again. That's the other word for regeneration. And this, I would like to say, is very closely linked together. And uh, I will not go into much detail about that. But just want to call out a few strong scriptures which talk about this. In John chapter 3 verse 5, it is Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. And he tells Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. And this born of water is not to be understood in terms of water baptism. It is something else which we can talk at a later time. But I just wanted to focus on being at the aspect of being born of the spirit. It is saying if you have, don't have this component of being born of the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless the spirit comes and touches and baptizes you, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Alright, it is the spirit's work that even makes you born again. Titus chapter 3 one, uh, verses 1 to 8. I just want to read verses four, 5 onwards and he says, it says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So then this regeneration of being born again as well is not our work. It is not that I have done anything to gain it. It's not I, I deserve it. I don't deserve it at all. The Bible says we are dead in our trespasses and sin. Unless and until God comes and touches us, I will not be able, able to confess His name or say, Jesus, I love you. Or Jesus is Lord. It's not even possible. It is the Spirit that even enables us and to the point of saying, even you can now say, I love Jesus. Or I want Jesus. Otherwise, I am dead in my sins and trespasses, I am least interested in the kingdom of God or in God himself. And so this aspect of being born again or even being touched is the work of the Holy Spirit and it, it, I would say this regeneration process is a work that is initiated by God and not by us. It is he who makes us born again. And the Holy Spirit is closely involved in this process. If you notice in John chapter 3, it says born of water and spirit. And Titus it says washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. You can clearly see that the work of the Holy Spirit is involved in adding us into the kingdom. And washing us and making us new as well. 
This is his work. And I would like to say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is closely linked to regeneration as well. But what we can surely understand is it is distinct from water baptism. Now what does the word baptism mean? Can anybody tell me? The root word, what does it mean? We have learned it in foundations. To immerse. To immerse. It is an immersion. It's a, it's a, it is like taking a sponge and putting in water and it comes out all soaked. It's an immersion. It's not a sprinkling. Alright. So as to say when you are water baptized, you are immersed in the water and it signifies something. It signifies as we see the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord. You come up, you are raised to a new life. That is what the symbol is. And even here, when we look at the Holy Spirit, you need to understand the word baptism from that context. Alright. Taking a bath so as to say in the Holy Spirit just being immersed in him now it is distinct from water baptism because we see in scripture that people were baptized in the Holy Spirit after water baptism and we had seen instances of people being baptized in the Holy Spirit even before water baptism so they are distinct from one another in the Old Testament time the work of the Spirit or the anointing of the Spirit was only limited to a few people he would come, do his work and he would go. It was not a permanent possession of a believer so as to say. He would come for a particular purpose. When the tabernacle was being built in the, in the wilderness, the spirit of God came on a certain person so that it enabled him to, to make the articles in the temple. But that's, that was the purpose, it came for and went. The spirit of the Lord would come on the prophet, would come on the king at certain times and go. But it was not a permanent possession. But we don't live in Old Testament times. We don't live in pre-Jesus times. We live in the times when we are, we, we are called children of God and we live in the, in, in the age of the spirit. In the New Testament times, it is say, said in Acts chapter 38, it's a, a, Sorry, Acts chapter 3 verse 30, it says, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see the gift, the Holy Spirit was a gift given to us by God. And he said, it is for everyone. It was for everyone. So it, this, this New Testament times we live in, the new covenant that we live in is where, where we all can receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. And it has to be given. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we are not Christians. We cannot be. It is a definite experience of which we can know whether we have or not have received. Now all of us would be in a place where we think, have I received the Holy Spirit? How do I know I have received the Holy Spirit? Is there any way that I can tell through any signs that I have seen around me or within me? Yes, there are. There has to be. Because when we look at uh, the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 1 to 2, Paul basically finds some disciples at Ephesus. Now, these are disciples, by the way. These are not just somebody who is walking on the road. These are people who claim to believe in Jesus. And he has met them at Ephesus and asked them, and he, uh, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So the expectation that Paul was having was, If you have received, if you have believed in Jesus, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Did you receive Him? And they tell him, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now that was very surprising. Paul and he said no it's, it should not be that way so there was uh, at least they knew they could differentiate and know whether they have received or not and the, if you look at the experiences listed in the Bible in the New Testament you know that it is a definite experience it was not I'm not sure it has, it has an assurance towards it if you have received it you will see the fruit in your life you will see your life changed you will not be the same old person it has to change you 
It is an operation distinct from conversion. Though at times both can occur simultaneously. You see when in the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 14. This is how it reads from 14 onwards. It says, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. You see, these again were believers. These were believers. Who have been baptized in the name of Jesus. And it is Philip who had gone, gone and given them the gospel. And they received Jesus. But they have not received the Holy Spirit yet. And the apostles with all urgency. When they heard that they, received, they have received Jesus in their life. They, they sent Peter and John. Saying go baptize them. They need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was it's not complete. And Peter and John go and baptize these believers in Samaria. So you see that they were converted, but it, is, it did not imply for them here that the Holy Spirit was given to them at the time of conversion. Though it can happen at the same time as well. Now, there are different symbolisms that are reflected in the Bible in understanding how, how the, of the, of the, and the word of the Holy Spirit, how He works. It, if in John chapter 7 verse 37 to 39, can someone open and read the Bible, read that scripture verse? John chapter 7 verse 37 to 39. day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as, in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Yeah, 39 as well. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, it says, this he spoke, it, it's about, it talks about the drinking, an aspect of drinking this living water. And Jesus is saying, if you come to me, I will give you this living water. And he says, this living water was supposed, was signified the Holy Spirit. Then again, you see in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine. For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's an aspect of also the uh, the aspect of being filled with the Holy Spirit, of baptized with the Holy Spirit. The words used there is also being filled. There is also being sealed. It is the Holy Spirit that seals us. Now I find this very important for us to understand. As I said, without the Holy Spirit, baptism, we are not believers. That is the signature of God over us on that covenant. And the seal of the Holy Spirit is something that we need to have. There's another symbol that God, the scripture gives us in terms of the Holy Spirit. Another word used there is being renewed. We are renewed in the Holy Spirit. Then being immersed in the Holy Spirit. That is, the, I give you the example of a sponge being uh, dipped in water. It's that aspect of just being completely soaked in the Holy Spirit, just standing and just getting wet completely in the Holy Spirit. There is no dryness in us. This is an aspect of being immersed. There's also being, it's also in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, see, we see that the words being used, He was poured out. He was poured out upon us. And then the 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, and Ephesians again talk about, He is the guarantee. He is a deposit for us. You see, if when we have to understand, we, if we as a church cannot live in thinking that if I have just had faith alone in Christ, I should be content with it. No, you should just be hungry for the Holy Spirit. To live a Christian life, He is required. He is required for us. Otherwise, we keep running dry. 
will keep struggling. Will keep being tossed here and there by the wind. When temptations come, trials come, tribulations come, we'll keep falling. And we'll keep wondering, why? I have believed in the Lord, but why am I still failing? Why am I struggling so much? Why don't I see victory in my life? And I believe the answer is because we, we don't have or not experience the filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It is only He who can help us come out of that. You see, when we look at the life of Jesus, biblical examples, right? Before Jesus started His ministry, He went to John the Baptist to be baptized in water for the sake of righteousness as such. But what happened before His ministry started? The Holy Spirit descended upon Him as a dove. It's only when He was filled or empowered with the Holy Spirit and it was a visible sign John the Baptist himself testified towards it. It's only after that here he went to do ministry. But before the ministry, he was taken for a time of testing in the wilderness. And he could come out of the testing because of the presence of the Holy Spirit with him. The apostles, before they could go into ministry, before they could go and fulfill the great commission or start the great commission, Jesus said, first go and wait. Tarry for some time in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Because I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit only after that you are supposed to start your ministry. Otherwise you will be, no, no, you can, cannot bear fruit. You will be empty. So the apostles themselves on the day of Pentecost received the Holy Spirit even before they started the ministry. We see Obviously, if you, I already read the scripture verses on the example of the people in Samaria, disciples. So it, it was the disciples as well who had to receive the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, their salvation was not complete. They were not sealed without the Holy Spirit. So we have enough of biblical examples and, and scripture verses to look at which calls out the need and importance for us to have Him in our lives. Without which we can just be weak and torn and useless. Now who baptizes you with the Holy Spirit? Can someone tell me? Who baptizes us? Lovely. Jesus. Jesus. Right. Exactly. Let's see a few scripture verses. Alright, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 8, it says, God who gives the Holy Spirit to you. In John chapter 14, verse 26, it says, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Alright, we already read the scripture verses where, where, it's, where it says, Jesus said, Until I am glorified, the Holy Spirit cannot come. So it, Jesus had to resurrect and go to the Father and then the Holy Spirit came. So it says the Father sends the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And we, need, we already know in the, book, uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 it says, John the Baptist says this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we should always understand that it's not a person or people around us who baptizes us. A pastor, an apostle may lay their hand upon you and pray for your baptism of the Holy Spirit. But it is Jesus who baptizes. Not the apostle or the pastor or any anointed man of God. The source is not the man of God. The source is Jesus himself, God himself. So our prayer, even the apostles or the man of God who has to pray to God. It is not saying, out of me, let the Holy Spirit come upon him. No. He prays to God, God, please pour out your Holy Spirit upon him. 
So the one who baptizes is Jesus himself. And who may receive? Everyone. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 and 39 says, Peter replied and said, Repent and be baptized every one of you. He's talking to those who claim to have accepted Jesus. He's saying, all those who have repented and been baptized, every one of you, you, you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He does not say you may receive. But as an assurance, saying that if you have put your faith in Jesus, He will give you the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is yours. So repent and be baptized, each and, every, each and every one. The promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. For all whom the Lord our God will call. It is for everyone whose name God has called out, whose name is written on the book of life. Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and 29 says and afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. Even my servants both men and women I will pour out my spirit in those days. You see it is not restricted to only men. Jesus says my Holy Spirit is given to everyone irrespective of your gender. That is the desire of God for us. That He wants to come and live in us through the Holy Spirit. And He says it's for all who believe. All who have believed in the name of Jesus. How then do we receive the Holy Spirit? Can someone read Luke chapter 11 verse 13? If you then bring evil, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There is an asking involved church. <coughs> at times when we don't receive the Holy Spirit at the same time when we are baptized in water or when we have when we have converted ourselves or believed in Jesus there is an asking involved. He's, we have to go before the Father and ask Lord I, I long for your Holy Spirit because I want to live the life that you want. You are calling me to. I cannot do it in my power. I need your Holy Spirit. And scripture says, Jesus is saying, you know, how much more, if evil people give good gifts to their children, a good God, a good father, how much more will he want to give the Holy Spirit to you? How much more? We already read this, the verse in John chapter 7. Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. So that we can go to Jesus, we can, we can go to the Father, we can go to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I want, I want to drink of the Holy Spirit. Will you give me the living water? Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, He says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees, neither sees Him nor knows Him. You know Him for He dwells with you and will be with you. There is an aspect of obedience that is involved. Jesus 
Jesus says, if you love me, obey me. But I will myself ask the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be received by the laying on of hands by the apostles. Now, as I said, it is not the apostles who baptize, but when they pray, when they lay their hands upon you, the Holy Spirit can come upon you. If the scripture verses that we can refer to are Acts chapter 8 verse 17, it says and they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 9, 9 chapter 17 also says the same thing in the same lines. So we can see that when the apostles laid their hands on the believers or on the disciples, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They prayed, they laid their hands, prayed for the believers and the Holy Spirit came and anointed them. We also see one thing which is very interesting. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 2 it says, Let me ask you only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And I found wonderful two, two wonderful examples in the Bible in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 10 verse 44. It says, while Peter was still saying these things. That means he was, he was talking about, he was giving the gospel. He was just sharing the word with the disciples. And it says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. On all who heard the word. Be careful then how you hear. Be careful then how you hear. If, if the Holy Spirit can come to you by hearing, by faith, and it's, it is a hearing that needs to be very sensitive to the word of God, while just preaching the word, the Holy Spirit fell on them. Because they received the word with faith. Another example is Acts chapter 11 verse 15 and it says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. He just began to speak the word of God. And the Holy Spirit fell on them. So there is not one standard way that we can say that you can receive the Holy Spirit. You can ask God, Jesus can ask the Father, you can ask Jesus directly, you can, uh, you can by faith, you can just hear the word and word of God and you may receive the Holy Spirit. You can receive the Holy Spirit, someone laying hands on you. But if one thing which is coming very strongly is God is trying different ways to make sure you have the Holy Spirit. He said, you need Him. I want you to have Him. You are incomplete without Him. You are incomplete without the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on us, Things change. Our lives change. We respond differently. We don't remain in sin. Though we may fall at times, but we don't love sin anymore. We don't hunger for sin. Now we hunger for God. Our lives are transformed. Tanga and I said, they're just talking about the same thing. If that is how important the Holy Spirit is, then we need to keep on praying. Because if we are not seeing lives transformed, if we are not seeing ourselves change, that means something is wrong. If you are living in disobedience to God, something is wrong. If you are still living in bondage to sin, something is wrong. He is not with us. The Holy Spirit is not in us. And he is critical for us. And that will always be found in the ICU. Without power. Not being healthy in the word of God. And says, if we, if, if, if we evaluate our lives today and we say, you know, before I was saved, this is what I used to do. And after I was saved, this is what I am doing. And if it's, it's an equal to sign, it's a big problem. A big problem.
is how we are reflecting more and more in the image of Christ every day will tell us whether we are Christians or not whether we have the Holy Spirit or not that's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13 it says for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the work of the spirit by which we are placed into the body of Christ. And we cannot miss this. It is one spirit is working in us. And he talks about this scripture after he talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So he is, uh, he is assuming that this, this Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit here that he's talking about. He's saying that if this Holy Spirit is in you, he has placed you in Christ's body. You are members of the church or you are part of Christ only by the Holy Spirit. If you don't have him, you are not of Christ. If you are not even in the kingdom of God, you are standing out and watching the kingdom. When we have the Holy Spirit, we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? When we read the benediction, when on the end of the of, on a Sunday service, when the pastor reads the benediction, sometimes most of them they read this benediction of saying that you know, the, now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do, do, we, do we understand the meaning of that word? He doesn't say the presence of the Holy Spirit. He says the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. The grace of God is sufficient for you. May the grace of God be sufficient for you. May the love of Christ be overflowing through you and in you. And more, and, and to just seal it, he's saying, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. He's saying, just as we are talking, just as we fellowship with one another, we have fun with another, we, we talk to one another, we, we go out dif to different places. The, the Holy Spirit is supposed to be being with us everywhere. We are supposed to be talking with Him in that way. And Paul is saying, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. But why does he want the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with us? Why? In John chapter 14 verse 26 it says, He teaches us all things and He will remind us of everything that Jesus said. He teaches us all things and remind us of everything that Jesus said. That means when I am not doing well or I am struggling or I don't understand the word I don't remember what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit will tell us, Hey, let me tell you. Let me remind you. This is what Jesus is talking about. So if you have to even understand the word of God is fellowship with the Holy Spirit is very important. In John chapter 16, verse 13 it says, that He, the Spirit of truth, will testify about Jesus. He doesn't speak of his own accord. He just screams of Jesus' name for you, before you. And he said, Jesus is for real. He's not someone imaginary. He's not someone who just lived 2000 years ago. No, he is very real right now in your life. And if we have fellowship with him, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with God the Father himself. We have fellowship with Jesus himself. But that only happens if we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And he keeps telling us about Jesus. He tells us, reminds us about what all Jesus did. He guides us into all truths. 
He tells us of what is yet to come. The plans, the purposes of God in your life or someone else's life. It says, He will tell you of what is yet to come. He reveals secrets to you. He reveals the secrets of the kingdom of God to us. In our self, in, we were studying on the book of Luke chapter 8 and we are studying the parable of the sower and we are looking at and Jesus says very interesting right he says I speak in parables but only those who really are interested will understand to only you who came to seek more the secrets of the kingdom will be revealed otherwise you will not be an understand what the parable means and how is it revealed through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will bring glory to Jesus by taking from what is His and making it known to us. Think about it. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. When He is in you, when you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, He takes from what is Jesus's and He makes it known to us. You want to know about Jesus? You know who to go to. You know who to depend on. And he will not lie. Because he is the spirit of truth. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And upon me. We become the temple of God. We don't go to the temple anymore. We do not go to the temple anymore. We carry the temple with us. Because... God himself indwells us through the Holy Spirit and we are the temple of God. This is the work of the Spirit. He sealed us for the day of redemption. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. It says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, of your salvation, and believed in Him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Same thing. If you have believed, He seals you. It's a guarantee. It's an assurance of the inheritance that you have. That is God Himself. And if the seal is not upon you, there is no inheritance. There is no salvation. He has to seal us. When the Holy, when we receive the Holy Spirit baptism, we receive power and boldness in witness. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We struggle today to witness, to give the gospel. We fear. If we give the gospel, someone will hit us. We have fear. If the apostles had the same fear, we would not be here. Am I right? If the apostles had the same fear, we would not be here. And Jesus said, you will receive power. Not fear. You will receive power. The baptism of the Spirit then refers to being equipped or empowered by God's Spirit to carry out the task that Jesus has given the church. In other words, when the Spirit equips us or baptizes us, we are immersed, as it were, in the Holy Spirit with the power necessary to carry out our mission and vocation as a Christian. He is important. If you want to give the Gospel, he is important. Without Him, 
we can do nothing. We have freedom in worship. And we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Does it not say, be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. We bear fruit. We bear the fruit of the Spirit. Now someone asks me, or I am asked always this question, how do I know I am filled with the Holy Spirit? How do I know that I have Him? It's not by the gifts. It's not by the gifts of the Spirit. The Corinthian church had the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they were operating mightily in it and yet Paul was criticizing them. And Paul had to bring correction to them and say this is not how you have to do it. So they were filled but not controlled. But that did not reflect. In fact, they were one of the most a, the, a church where a lot of adultery was found. Sin was found in their midst. So definitely the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not a sign that you are filled. Because there can be counterfeit gifts as well. Anything that is precious has a counterfeit. So there can be a counterfeit to speaking in tongues. There can be a counterfeit to prophecy. There can be a counterfeit to all the, all the gifts that I mentioned. But when it comes to the fruit, it's difficult to have a counterfeit. Because it is difficult to bear. Now what is the fruit of the Spirit? It says, but the, in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control and against such things there is no law. Now if we are bearing fruit, if you and I can see ourselves bearing fruit of the Spirit, you can be assured that you have the Holy Spirit with you. And we should be growing in the fruit. We may not be perfect in everything in the day one, but are we growing in it? Are we growing in the fruit? Am I seeing this fruit visible in me every day more and more? Am I being conformed to the image of Christ more and more every day? Then yes, I have received the Holy Spirit. Else I have to examine myself to see whether I am in the Lord or not. I can have spiritual gifts, like I said. It can be manifested in my life. There are gifts, many gifts. We will go through the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit much detail in the next two uh, sermons. But I just wanted to highlight what it really is. It, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 8 onwards it says, And to one is given the spirit of utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, yet to another the interpretation of tongues. So you see these all are available as gifts, but we need not have them to prove that we are filled in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says each of us will have at least one gift, but it's all for the common good, it's not for ourselves. It is to use, be used for the common good, it's not for yourself. So if we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, if we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit in us, the fruit will be evident. There will be signs of the gifts of the Spirit in us. We receive righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is what Romans 4, chapter 14 verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now when we see all these things, the results, how much are we seeing ourselves doing this or being it? That will help us to know whether we are believers or not. Whether we are Christians or not. Whether we, our salvation has been sealed or not. Or if we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit or not. 
what do we see in ourselves? Finally, there are some misunderstandings that we have. Now being filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean that I am a perfect person and I am sinless. Alright, power can come in an instant but fruit takes time to grow. So the Spirit works in us. We are being sanctified every day. We are being made holy every day. So there is God working in us every day, changing us. And we have to respond to that voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of Christ saying, don't go here, don't go there, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. And as we heed to that voice, is when we become more and more like Jesus. But we do have our failures. And the word of God says that if anybody does sin, let him confess his sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all unrighteousness. So there is a possibility that we can sin, but we do not repeat it. We do not go on sinning. If our lifestyle is one of, we keep on going on sinning, then it is a big doubt we are saved. It is more probable that we are still lost and we are fooling ourselves. That we are Christians. But we are not. Another misunderstanding is that it is a once and for all experience. But no, it is not. It is uh, we, we can go on getting filled. But there is one baptism but many fillings. Alright. There is one baptism but many fillings. That means I can only receive the Holy Spirit once. I don't get baptized by the Holy Spirit every time. The baptism happens once. But you can be filled with the Holy Spirit continually. That means as the Holy Spirit, uh, as we are baptized, that sealing is done. Now when a particular, God takes us to do a particular task, He may just fill us all the more with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to complete that work. Or if He wants to, we are speaking for example to millions of people before us. God may just fill us with the Holy Spirit in great power and we may speak of the word of God with such power that people will be converted. So at those times God keeps filling. The, we have seen that the book of Acts keeper shows us a lot that the, the apostles were filled when they were speaking the word of God. Philip was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was speaking the word of God and getting the gospel. But he was already baptized. So we can have these experiences of being filled every time. But baptism is only once. It does not remove the need for other means of grace. Which means that because we have, we have the Holy Spirit and we are baptized now, it doesn't mean we stop praying and all the, it, 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 all the more we have to pray. We, so prayer, Bible study, worship, fellowship, self-discipline, church discipline, etc. are all essential to a spirit-filled believer. All these are essential for a spirit-filled believer. You cannot say, I don't feel like doing it, I don't want to do it, maybe I'll do it, I don't want to do it, I'll go to church today, I won't go to church next Sunday. Uh, no. If you are really filled and you are baptized, if you have the Holy Spirit upon you, if you are sealed, God has changed your heart. You have realized that change in your heart and you just want to love God more. And because you love God more, you want to just focus on Him more and more. And that's why we can live by the verse which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you. You don't run after those things. You seek after God. You run after God. And when you have your focus right and your priority right and you run after Him, He will give you what you need. He will not give you everything what you want, but He will give you what you need. It does not solve all our problems in life. Being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean all our problems are solved. No. It gives us the power to face our problems. Because His presence is with us. His fellowship is, is with us. So when we are in trouble, when we are in need, He tells us, He guides us, He counsels us. Otherwise, He, otherwise he would not be called a counsellor. He would not be called the one who delivers us. He would not be called the one who comforts us. If you are happy all the time, do we need anybody to comfort us? No. It's only when we have times of 
tribulation or times of trials and we are not doing that well. He comes as a comforter for us. He comes as a comforter for us. It's just, it's a gateway and not a goal. What do I mean by that? There are spiritual gifts. We don't, don't chase. I said, don't go after the spiritual gifts. Go after the one who gives the spiritual gifts. We go after the Holy Spirit. Alright, there are spiritual battles, there is new power, but there are also new temptations as well. So we need not only be baptized in the Spirit, but we must also learn to walk in the Spirit. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit and His fellowship is with us, He speaks and we need to walk. We listen and we walk. And that is what we should do as Christians. And lastly, the experience comes to different people in different ways. Not all of us have extreme experiences of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Or being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We may see different people respond differently. Some cry, some fall or whatever it is. We have to be discerning to know what is from God, what is not even in, in that. Not every experience or manifestation is from God. We have to seek the help of the Spirit to know what is really from, what manifestation is from Him. Otherwise, we can receive a counterfeit manifestation. Because the devil is seeking to devour us and fool us and cheat us. And we need to be careful there. But we all can have different experiences. We, we may just receive him in a way that is, uh, that is very silent. But we have seen, but we, we experience such joy in our heart that we know our lives have changed. Or we may just receive it such power that we just fall down and we just fall down to worship and we speak uh, speak forth in praises or we prophesy or we speak in tongues. It is His choice how what manifestation has to come upon us. But after that manifestation, the one way to validate whether that experience is genuine or not is to see whether are you bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Has your life changed? If no, then there's a problem. That manifestation is not true. Now as we dwell on this, I, I would like us to just bow our heads and ask Lord, where do, Lord, where do I stand today in your presence? Have I been sealed in the Holy Spirit? Do I see the results of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life? Do I see the results of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life? Because Lord, if I, I, I'm, I'm struggling, Lord, I, maybe I'm not really sealed. I've just believed, I've expressed faith in you, but I've not been sealed yet. And I want to be sealed. I don't want to be without your Holy Spirit. I need your Holy Spirit. I need to be baptized by your Holy Spirit. And if, if that is your cry today, I want to just cry out to God. And express to him and tell him, Lord, I need you. I need your Holy Spirit. Please fill me today.